Hey, it's Mike here, and today a very recent beef industry funded study appears to show that plant proteins have the same muscle protein synthesis or muscle building effect as beef, aka cow muscle. And with their hypothesis, they seem to have specifically set out to prove that these incomplete plant proteins would not be as good, but the results shocked even me. The results were not teeny. They were proteiny. <clears throat> so of course we're gonna crack this study open and look at even those secondary results that they found in terms of glucose and insulin levels, as well as hunger and satiety. And we're gonna frame this all in terms of a shifting landscape on plant protein research in terms of better results when we're talking about muscle building studies and changing positions by doctors as well. So let's just go. The study was published very recently in the Journal of Nutrition, and this was a crossover trial and also had a control group. So it was a little bit of an interesting design in which they randomized women to either a group in which they were randomly assigned to eat three different meals in different orders. And that was compared to the other women that were put into a control group, a little confusing, but this was on middle-aged women who were considered healthy. And they also had everybody, regardless of what they were eating, do 30 minutes of treadmill walking during this day that they did the test. So that way the exercise was standardized. And just to throw the funding right out there in the beginning, quote, this study was supported by the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, a contractor to the beef checkoff. And I will say this study was not super large. It had 17 total participants, but I will say it appeared to collect a lot of data, which helped reach statistical significance for certain comparisons. Like they actually took three muscle biopsy samples from their quad in a day. And then in terms of what these three different meals were, well, we have number one, which of course was beef that they're calling the complete protein. And then number two, which they consider incomplete but complementary protein sources, which included navy slash black beans, as well as whole wheat bread. This is where you can see a little bit of the bias leak through because that meal itself became a complete protein, but they're still trying to make it seem inferior to beef. And then we have number three, which they say was incomplete protein, which was either beans or whole wheat. And then they had this separate low protein group where women were just given a meal of just five grams of protein, completely devoid of protein as a control. And you might be thinking what I was thinking, a meal that just uses whole wheat as the protein source is really weird. And I don't know anybody that does that, eats that way, but it is the case that they matched the total grams of protein. So these people were eating the same amount of protein from whole wheat. I can just imagine the researchers sitting around thinking of this study. Oh yeah, I'm thinking we'll do a study where we just hypothesize that plant protein suck compared to beef you know, quick payday, we'll all be good. What are we thinking as a comparison meal? I was thinking of just throwing them some straight whole wheat. That's a classic plant-based protein source that those idiots fully rely on. <laughs> but in terms of those people who were randomized to the three meals, they were saying that they were provided with, quote, a complete amino acid profile over 24 hours. And just to zoom out here, I wanted to add that for you to not get a complete amino acid profile in terms of just meeting all of your essential amino acid minimums in a day, you have to be eating just a really unbalanced diet and chronometer shows this like yeah if you're eating 2000 calories of whole wheat you're hitting almost every essential amino acid there except you're going to be low on say lysine by a bit but but if you just add a cup of black beans in there subtract the calories from wheat so that you're still at 2000 calories, you're slamming through everyone, you know, 130% of lysine met. So yeah, you have to really screw up and never in a day of documenting what I eat on chronometer have I not gotten all of my essential amino acids. So anyway, let's move on to what even is muscle protein synthesis and how are they measuring it? We'll go through this quickly. Muscle protein synthesis is simply our body turning amino acids that we eat or are in our body into muscle protein so they get integrated into the muscle cell. All right, let's not keep you guys waiting. I wanna to get to the main results here and that is muscle protein synthesis as measured by fractional synthetic rate. We'll talk about what that actually is in a second, but just know right now that as this study mentions, it is the gold standard for skeletal muscle protein synthesis measuring. And those results are, as they say, when comparing these three meals that have the same amount of protein, whether it was beef, the mixed plants, or the single plant sources, they say that they, quote, do not differentially stimulate muscle protein synthesis after a meal or daily. So translation, the study found that 
eating the same amount of grams of protein from whole wheat, straight up whole wheat, which again, people are not relying on from protein, led to the same amount of muscle protein synthesis results. And again, they did this using fractional synthetic of rate, which is really a general term for seeing how much of something is absorbed in a given amount of time. And in this case, it was how much of a particular amino acid, the essential amino acid phenylalanine was absorbed from muscle biopsies. And what we have to keep in mind, there was no statistical difference between these three meals, whether it's the beef, the complementary plant protein, or the incomplete plant protein. We can look to this chart and we can see the incomplete on the right actually trending at the highest amount of muscle protein synthesis in that case. And that was over a 24 hour period. And to be fair, I will say that the incomplete protein didn't do quite as well in one sort of indirect sense, and that was the muscle protein synthesis right after meals. And we can see that both the beef one and the complementary plant one were statistically significantly different from the low five gram protein control. So it wasn't statistically significantly different from control, but also not statistically significantly different from the beef and complementary protein meals but still not correct to say that beef outperformed the incomplete plant protein. So things that you can accurately say here, it's a little muddy. And now let me introduce you to Dose for Your Liver, which is a clinically backed organic liver health supplement, which I find to be absolutely delicious. I would describe the flavor as orange juice that was supercharged with even more flavor. Love it. And I think that's the result of having all these amazing plants in it. For example, it has 17 shots worth of turmeric in terms of turmeric's bioactive compound. And it also has orange, dandelion, ginger, and milk thistle. And all of that contributes to why I feel really good taking this stuff. But yeah, your liver is super important in terms of your overall health, your energy levels, your digestive health, your skin clarity and our environment today exposes us to a lot of things that could affect liver function. And I know you guys are very science-based. This is a science channel and Dose has multiple clinical studies. They have a six month study on 120 people with normal liver function. And the result was that the majority of people improved their liver markers as well as their cholesterol levels too. And on that second study on people with impaired liver function had a decrease in multiple liver enzymes by 50% massively outperforming placebo. And in particular, the markers ALT and AST, both of which you don't want to be high in terms of liver function. And if you would like to try Dose for Your Liver, you can click below and just use the code VEGAN30 to get 30% off your first purchase of a Dose for Your Liver subscription. And just in terms of creating new muscle, surprisingly, our body is actually turning over about 1% of our muscle mass per day, which sounds huge, especially when you realize that for the average person, about 40% of their body weight is muscle, which could of course be well over 100 pounds. But then once you subtract the water, et cetera, the average person is landing in at around 12 pounds of actual muscle protein on their body, which translates to about 54 grams on average in terms of the amount of muscle protein that's turned over per day. And you might be thinking, oh yeah, you gotta eat all that. And people are told, the average woman is told to eat 46 grams and average man 56 grams of protein per day, but it's huge to note that we don't have to get all of our protein from diet, we recycle it. In fact, as this study mentions, when our muscles break down, they supply amino acids back into the free pool, most of which are recycled and reused. So we're talking probably 28 or less grams of protein actually needing to be added to the system. Now they also did some blood tests. They just looked at how many amino acids were ending up in people's blood after these meals. And it's no surprise when looking at certain essential amino acids that are just higher in this meat that they were given. They would have also been higher in soy than the plant products that were given as well, but that we of course saw higher levels, things like leucine. However, they say, quote, this did not translate into a greater breakfast meal area under the curve response for total amino acids, which makes sense because these people were all fed the same amount of total amino acids. Now, unless you're that control group that was just given five grams, but for the main three meals, the same amount. That fact in the study itself majorly calls into question the protein digestibility scores, you know, that have been used as an argument against plant protein by say Chris Kresser on Joe Rogan, for example, but they're often determined by giving animals uncooked like grains and other products and feeding that into calculations. Yeah, those need to be reevaluated. You know, and you've probably heard 
heard that having more of these essential amino acids makes something superior in terms of muscle, et cetera. So why wouldn't we see actual better muscle protein synthesis when we're seeing an increase in these essential amino acids in beef compared to the plant proteins in complete, et cetera. And one answer to that could simply be that we're peeing out most of these proteins, especially people over consuming proteins in a standard American diet. You know, each of these meals had over 20 grams of protein. It's very unlikely that people were going to be absorbing all of the protein that they were eating. And so they were just essentially getting enough across all three of these groups to have the same result. And there's another area at least looking at for an answer, and that has to do with other blood results such as glucose and insulin. We'll talk about insulin in a second, its relationship to muscle growth, but just we see this glucose chart right here and people's gut response might be, oh my God, that incomplete protein group had higher glucose, clearly it's worse. Well, that peak was just 125, which is well within like a healthy, peak response to a meal. Like over 200 would be a diabetic blood sugar postprandial or after meal response. This is fine. But with that higher glucose, as you might expect, we could also see a bit of a higher insulin curve for that plant protein, especially the incomplete one. This is interesting because insulin is a hormone that is involved in growth, as this study mentions on the topic of insulin and muscle protein synthesis. Quote, insulin is a potent anabolic or muscle growing stimulus for muscle proteins, and insulin deficiency leads to a protein catabolic state or loss with loss of muscle mass that can only be reversed by insulin therapy. So the question is, are these insulin differences actually clinically relevant? And I would just go right ahead and say that we have a lot of mixed literature on the idea that adding carbs is gonna increase insulin and help with muscle growth. And we have various studies giving people protein or protein plus carbs and measuring the difference. This study, for example, found that, quote, we conclude that ingestion of carbohydrates improved net leg protein balance after resistance exercise. The effect is delayed and really not even that large, so it could just be missed. And also back to what we learned about protein being recycled and reused in our body, they actually say, quote, the improved net balance in the carbohydrate group was due primarily to progressive decrease in muscle protein breakdown. They're saying that the carb group in this case ended up just breaking down their muscles less, so it was more of a preservation situation. But then we have another study like this that adds 50 grams of carbs on top of 25 grams of protein or just a protein control and finds no difference in muscle protein synthesis. And there could be a lot of factors here. We could be talking about the group's weight, their exercise level, their insulin resistance itself, et cetera. But back to the actual topic at hand here of this study, no matter which way you spin this, this is a really persuasive result for people that are going, oh, I have to have large amounts of animal protein at every single meal. I know several of those people uh, this study is very much saying that you don't. And next we have various satiety, fullness, hunger type scores from just qualitative responses. And so we have hunger and fullness scores, which trended slightly better for the plant groups, but they weren't statistically significantly different. However, the metrics desire to eat and could eat again, which I love, could eat again, uh, were statistically significantly better in the plant groups. And I think that's just a result of actually having fiber in there and then also just probably an increased volume, et cetera, and carbohydrates, I think including more macronutrients contributes to satiety. And these results, in my opinion, have a huge implication for obesity. It's something we've seen over and over again that just including these things like fiber, et cetera, leads to less calorie consumption. And it's also likely why from multiple studies, vegans are the ones that are hanging in there in the normal BMI range, the only dietary group doing that. All others tend to average overweight in the US especially. And all of this brings me to the question, again, why did they even release the results of this study when they were essentially going against their hypothesis and against what would be in the best interest of their industry, which is beef. And that interest, of course, is making plant protein look like a completely inferior crap source that you don't wanna rely on. It's been the narrative for decades. Now, I don't actually have the answer on this, but I can hypothesize, which hopefully my hypothesize won't be proven wrong and published <laughs> uh, like theirs, uh, but, <laughs> but they appear to have grant funding here, one of which is a NIH funded grant, which is meant to be looking at middle-aged and older people and aging. They also say they were supported by University of Texas medical grant, I believe as well. And so the question is, did these have the stipulation 
that they had to release the results, I don't know. Now maybe you just can't bury results against what you were trying to show if it's NIH funded, etc. And also makes me think of how the research meetings went. Oh uh, yeah, so we got our results in and it appears that the uh, plant protein did just as good. So uh, we'll just bury this whole thing pretend like it never happened. What's that? We have to publish it because we took grant money so that we could basically do discounted research to promote our products. And this brings me to the bigger picture of a lot of this research also being done specifically so that it can be blasted into a news cycle. So if we had different results, we very likely would have seen a Daily Mail article running a title along the lines of plant protein proven inferior to beef in new groundbreaking study. All vegans simultaneously die of protein deficiency. Now that's why these studies are engineered from the ground up, why they're created in the first place. And I think in this situation, even trying to use whole wheat as a protein source, uh, it still backfired. <laughs> like they tried to stack the deck and the deck decked them, okay? And I want to frame this again within the literature that we've been seeing over the last decade or so, and even more recently. And there's a study I've mentioned a lot in terms of real people or real results that really sums this up perfectly, saying that it is the amount, not animal versus plant protein, that determines muscle mass in older adults, again, as well there, which I always say is important because protein absorption allegedly goes down and digestion can be worse when you're older. But no, plant protein does just fine. And then we have this study which I think should just blow people's minds who are biased against plant protein. And this was one where they actually were having people do resistance training and they were eating either animal or plant protein and measuring not just muscle protein synthesis, not just muscle growth, but also actual strength improvements. And while they reported that everything was the same between the plant and animal group, I always have to mention that the incline bench results were statistically significantly better in the plant protein group. And these are people that are just normal people that were randomized to plant or animal protein. Amazing results. And this brings me to how we're even seeing some doctors change their opinion. Dr. Ids is somebody who I generally largely agree with and something in the past I've disagreed with him on is plant versus animal protein or superiority, whatever you want to call it. And just recently he made a video saying that he was wrong. So good on him. So over two and a half years ago, I made a video stating that animal protein was superior to plant protein in the context of muscle building. But I was wrong, so I'm taking myself to school. Since I made my video, there has been well-controlled human studies that have made me re-look at the total evidence base and therefore I have changed my view on this topic. So this study took 38 young men. They did a 12-week training program at a protein intake of 1.6 grams per kilogram. And again, no differences in lean mass, cross-sectional area or strength between vegan or meat eaters. Another control study tested pea versus whey protein for 12 weeks. Once again, no differences in strength or size between groups. So I think one thing is clear, if you're consuming an adequate amount of protein above 1.6 grams per kilogram, then all of the evidence we have thus far suggests that animal and plant proteins are comparable for gains. So now he's straight up saying that, yeah, plant protein is adequate. It's not inferior by any meaningful metric here nowadays with all the new results. And then I also just have to mention some other benefits, of course, you're gonna be getting more positive side effects from eating plant protein. So again, they come packaged with antioxidants in many cases, as well as fiber and water and things that are gonna help you be more full. You know, things that are gonna help prevent diseases. We have several studies showing that plant protein reduces mortality compared to animal protein. And then of course, there's also major environmental differences if we're looking at the carbon impact, the greenhouse gas emissions footprint of animal versus plant protein, plant protein crushes in that. And then of course, there are also these, you know, these beings called animals that I think would prefer to not be killed for a protein that is equivalent to proteins where they don't have to die. So in the end, even though I think they did stack the deck, you know, they weren't using the higher quality protein sources like soy in this study at all. And they were again using whole wheat as one of the incomplete proteins, which is, you know, a lot more incomplete than other proteins that are missing an amino acid or so. Uh, they still got results that were against their hypothesis that the plant and the animal protein were the same in terms of that muscle protein synthesis result. So I think for vegans, adequate protein, once again, is more of an issue of just adequate calorie consumption or not just having some insane, weird, like breatharian, you know, or a completely protein devoid, like apple juice based diet or celery or something like that. <laughs> Cause at the end of the day, again, we're talking about 56 grams of protein turnover on average. Now in somebody's whole body worth of muscles and then the majority of that being recycled, clearly we don't need to be slamming down the like 100, 150, even 200 grams of animal protein that people think that they need to, which of course is also strapped with all of that saturated fat and animal 
animal-based cholesterol, heme iron, etc., which also promotes heart disease and other diseases. Like processed meat, still a class 1A carcinogen. The idea that somebody's gonna try to slam that down to get enough protein is just, it boggles my mind. Anyway, again, if you would like to try Dose for your liver, you can click below and use that code VEGAN30 for 30% off your first subscription order of Dose. And as usual, let me know down below what you think about this study. If there are any little details that I missed, I would love to hear that. And of course, feel free to like, subscribe, all that good stuff, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.